This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. A long time ago, in a theater far, far away. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Free Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So, if you've been living on Neptune for the last year, you may not have heard there's a new Star Wars movie. That would probably be it, yes. <laughs> now, there's plenty of coverage of that. So, I thought we could talk about the original movie. Okay. And you really can't overstate the impact of Chapter 4, A New Hope, in 1977. Because it had such a huge impact on both movies and marketing. Mm-hmm. It's really pre- and post-Star Wars. It is, yes. <laughs> it's such a huge change. Mm-hmm. Now, you heard about the movie before it came out. Yes. I, had, I had not. Yes. But, I was uh, a freshman in high school. I was mm-hmm. a little bit older than mm-hmm. you. And I'm pretty sure it must have been Starlog. I assume it had to be. There was no... Long before the internet. And I didn't really read many magazines, per se, then. But I was really into science fiction still mm-hmm. then. And... Uh, I was really, really excited. I dragged a friend of mine to the movie the first day, the very first showing. Yeah. And we didn't even have to wait in line or anything. (laughs) But when we came out afterwards, and my friend had no idea what it was going to be about her. She was just, like, over the moon about Mm -hmm. it after we came out. But when we came out, there was a line around the movie theater. So I think we just got lucky that, you know, we got there, like, for the 12 o'clock or whatever showing. Do you remember the name of the theater? I don't remember the name of the theater, but it was the... um, movie theater that was in Brookfield Square Shopping Center okay. at the time. Uh, and my mom probably drove us to work when she gr- drove us there when she was driving to work that day or something mm-hmm. and because of course we wouldn't have had driver's license. Yeah. And um it was it was either still a single screen or maybe they had converted it into a two screen theater by mm-hmm. that time. But it was certainly not a multiplex. Yeah. You yeah. know. Well I so. saw yeah I saw it at the McKinley Theater in Canton, which is no longer there. And then ended up seeing it many times at the Belden Village Twin, which mm-hmm. is also no longer there. Yeah. And, you know, the Belden <laughs> Village uh, is a lot like what Brookfield Square was like. Mm-hmm. And and I imagine that it was very similar at that point in time yeah. and with the, the tiny little movie theater. and. <laughs> so Fox didn't have a lot of confidence in the idea of this. A throwback to movie serials with a mostly unknown cast. There was an eight million dollar budget, with, which ah, overshot to oh a oh my gosh, eight million dollars, <laughs> which overshot to a massive thirteen million dollars. Mm-hmm. Which, frankly, you couldn't get one a bigger star into a movie for that amount of money no. just to pay him, much no. less make the movie. I imagine that Harrison Ford was paid more than thirteen million dollars <laughs> for the latest. Oh, I would assume. Yeah. So at one point, Lucas gave up a five hundred thousand dollar director's payment in exchange for keeping the merchandising rights. And, you know... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Which Fox was happy to accept, because at the time, that wasn't at a At that big point deal. in time, you know, that would never happen now. No. For any movie, I no. don't think. So we'll talk more about that later. But the film did open on Memorial Day weekend, 1977, although it didn't go wide until July. Yeah. Now, I don't remember when I, exactly I went to go see it first, but it... Apparently, it was only a handful of theaters until July. Well, I'm pretty sure it was fairly early in the summer that I saw it, and it might even have been that Memorial Day weekend, although I don't know why Brookfield Square would have had it. Yeah. But um, it wasn't very long after we got out of school that we went, because I was pretty much hibernating for the summer. I (laughs) never did anything during the summer, so. So, back then, of course, movies, in many cases, took months to get to a wide audience. Mm -hmm. It wasn't... 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 no. screens all at once. It was like, well, we'll make several copies. We'll put out major cities. Then we'll move to the smaller cities. Move smaller and smaller. Especially when the studio didn't have a con- any confidence in the movie. Well, there were a lot less screen. I'm not going to say movie theaters, but screens back then. Because most movie theaters only had one or two screens. Maybe four at the most. Right. Right. You know, so even now, you know, you see the big movies will be playing on four or five screens at the same theater. Hmm. You know, then it was just one screen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about some of the stats. (laughs) Prior to 1977, Fox's largest annual profits as a movie studio were $38 million. Mm -hmm. 
1977, they made $79 million. Oh, jeez. <laughs> the original run, Memorial Day weekend 1977, until Labor Day weekend 1978, 15 months. And you would never see a 15-month run <laughs> in the theaters now. It made $307 million at the box office. It holds number seven all-time domestic. Number two, adjusted for inflation, which based on that puts it at $1.4 billion. It was re-released in 78, 79, 81, 82, and then got the special edition, which with all these new effects, in 1997, you know, where Han didn't shoot yeah. first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Won six Oscars, art direction, costume design, film editing, original score, sound, and visual effects. And I have to think that if it was actually hadn't been in that sci-fi category that still gets a little bit of the yeah, shaft, it, right. it would have done a little better on there. Right, but it was nominated for Best Picture. It was nominated for Best Director and Supporting Actor for Alec Guinness. Mm -hmm. So, in 1977 to 78, in that period, I was about 13, 14 years old. Every few weekends, I went to see the movie again and again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was just like what she did. It's like, what are you going to do this? Oh, let's go see Star Wars again. Let's go again. see Star Wars again. <laughs> and... You know, you can't do that now because no. movies don't stay in the theater that long. But that movie literally stayed in theaters for a year and a half. And you have to wonder, you know, what happened to the other movies that should have been coming out yeah. then. <laughs> well, every studio was retooling. It was like it was like when they went from, <laughs> really, when they went from the silence to the talkies. Mm -hmm. It was like science fiction, everything. Anything that was in there... In their possession, that was science fiction related, got greenlit immediately. Mm -hmm. There was a ton of science fiction that came out of this. But if you went to the stores in the summer of 1977, you wouldn't find a lot of Star Wars stuff to buy. Nope. Because merchandising prior to Star Wars was an afterthought. You'd bring in some, the who's the junior paralegal <laughs> back in the closet somewhere, have him write the contract for the merchandising. Yeah. Because it, it was... It was just like this rounding error to, to the studios and to the publishing companies. Mm -hmm. And movies rarely got a lot of merchandise because it took so long to work out the details, manufacture the stuff, and then get it on the shelves. And, and it would be hard to coordinate getting it on the shelf when the movies were actually in the theater and popular. And they didn't want to take a chance until the movie was out. Right. And so only ongoing franchises like James Bond mm -hmm. would get merchandise. And TV shows really only got them after they became hits, like in their second or third season. Mm -hmm. And even then, you might get a board, board game, game, you might get a lunchbox. Mm -hmm. You know, especially if you look for for stuff that was that was uh, licensed merchandise in the '60s, it would be like a gun, like a plastic gun in a plastic bag with the with the cardboard up at the top, and it would say Hogan's Heroes on it. I mean, mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, like, whatever. We really don't care. It's just crap. We don't care. Mm -hmm. But by 1978, you really couldn't get away from Star Wars merchandise because it really changed the game. Yeah. Mego was offered the action figure contract, and Mego was the big player then because they yes. were doing the DC figures, and these mm -hmm. were, of course, the larger figures that were... That were uh, had cloth. They actually had uniform, clothes. Yeah, yeah, clothes and all this. Mm -hmm. But they balked at the cost, so Kenner got it instead. And by the way, Mego no longer exists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Kenner is now part of Hasbro, and I think that Mattel owns them now. I don't know. <laughs> but there was no way to get the toys to the stores by Christmas of 1977. It just couldn't be done because you, you had to have them made in Asia and shipped over, and it was a big process. You and could you, probably do it now, but you could Maybe, do it then. but th then you were talking seven months between the mm -hmm. movie coming out, getting the contract, and doing it. Well, and you think about just the advances in technology that allow you to make some of these things yeah, now. Yeah, you can prototype you like know, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so this forced the creation of one of the most brilliant marketing ideas ever, something that I assume marketing majors like have to write papers on this. <laughs> The Star Wars IOU. A desperate parent of a kid who loves Star Wars could buy the Star Wars Early Bird Certificate Package. A picture on cardboard of the four Star Wars figures they could receive between February and June 1978 by sending it back to Kenner. <laughs> uh, I, I, the number of disappointed kids that found this under the tree in 1977 Christmas. Well, <laughs> it has to be massive. It's like, 
what is this? <laughs> a piece of cardboard with a picture. Now, of course, there would eventually be over a hundred action figures just in the original run, and probably thousands yeah. in all these subsequent runs. One of which was recalled. It was a Boba Fett figure that launched a rocket from its back that became a choking hazard. And now it's one of the most prized collectibles because almost all of them got snapped up. Mm -hmm. Lightsabers were another issue because... They were they, they were separate and and they just you kind of put them in their hand and they were choking hazards again. So later figures had the saber go up the arm of the figure, <laughs> like a switchblade. Yeah, saber. exactly. Yeah, and you just go. <laughs> well, that kind of makes sense. And that yeah. way you can't you can't lose it and yeah. you can't choke on it. Mm -hmm. And you could get Star Wars bed sheets and T-shirts and model kits and bubble gum and costumes, mm -hmm. whatever you want. Lucas sold the comic rights to Marvel, who published the first issue one month before the premiere. Wow. And there was a novelization that came out in 1976, a year before the movie. I wonder if maybe that's what I read that made me excited about the Might movie. Be. Because I did read it, you know. It's supposedly written by Lucas, but actually goes written by Alan Dean Foster. And now if you get it, it does say Alan Dean Foster now as, they do. as the author. And then, of course, there's the Star Wars Holiday Special. Only aired once on CBS in 1978. It's best known for the Wookiees celebrating Life Day, B. Arthur running the Cantina Bar, an inappropriate holo film featuring Diane Carroll, and the first appearance of Boba Fett before Empire Strikes Back in cartoon form. Mm -hmm. It is in continuity because of that. Yeah. <laughs> and they lined up most of the actual cast for this mostly... <laughs> Live action disaster. <laughs> Lucas disowned it and destroyed the master copies. Although from what I was reading, he got the dailies. So it's not like it was like he's like I don't remember anything about that. Oh, it, it just came up well, and oh now I hate it. It's like well you knew about it all along. Maybe he didn't watch the dailies. <laughs> That's I he must not have. Yeah. So you can't find it officially, but you can easily find it on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> you know they may not be the best copies or anything, right. but you can get the general idea. But really, you probably don't want to watch it. And the theory is, once Lucas passes away, they think that they'll agree to go ahead and put it out, officially. Well, do you think he's, that he sold that along with the other Star Wars things? Well, or? So, I was reading that apparently CBS owns part of it. This is one of these, oh, okay. Fox owns part of it. It's, yeah, it's, I don't think it's part of the whole thing that Marvel bought the okay. rights to. All right. So. <laughs> well, but, Star Wars holds a place in my heart, mm -hmm. at least the first mm -hmm. three. Right. Movies. What? There are there are other other movies. I'm not aware of those. <laughs> and we will be seeing yes the next one probably right. not till after Christmas. Right. Uh, and we hope that you guys all go see it too. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you can listen to our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. And may the force be with you.